time, we talked about classification in early human cultures. But now, um, as science starts to become more and more commonplace, we're discovering new things, Europeans are colonizing the world, we're um, discovering new people, new plants, it gets worse. Unfortunately, the history of anthropology is pretty racist. Um, one of my favorite quotes about this is from the textbook of Human Biological Variation. The study of human biological diversity is challenging and has been historically fraught with controversy. Really, what we're talking about here is the early history of scientific racism. This is any attempts to justify these racial boundaries with science that usually lead to discrimination or subjugation of one group by another. Classification in itself is pretty natural. Um, you can see this through Car Carlos Linnaeus. He wrote the Systema Naturae in the 1700s, um, and we still use his uh, classification system for species, though his early editions were a little weird. In this edition here, he actually put orangutans and chimpanzees in the same species, Homotrogdoditis, in the same genus as us. Um, here we have several other species, Homo caudatus, Homo monstrosus, Homo nocturnus, and Homo lucifer. So caudatus means people with a tail, monstrosus is monsters, uh, Homo nocturnus is people who live in the night, um, and I believe Homo lucifer is demons. So you can see he's including things that don't exist in his classification system. Um, though he also included um, several different classifications of humans. So you can see here they are listed as subspecies. So humans are Homo sapiens. Then we have subspecies Africanus, Americanus, Asiaticus, and Europaeus. I'm sure you can easily tell that Africanus refers to Africans, Americanus is Native Americans, Asiaticus is Asians, and Europaeus is Europeans. In this edition, he also included Homo sapiens ferus. So these are feral children, including a new subspecies specifically for them. And Homo sapiens monstrosus are people with body modification. So this is, again, um, pretty racist against other cultures that have body modifications, such as piercing or elongating different body parts or even um, different body adornments. So as Europeans were discovering the rest of the word, they were shocked at what other cultures chose to do to their bodies, offended their delicate sensibility. So even though this is a couple hundred years old at this point, um, this is still kind of transferred, transferred to the today in some ways. So this was related to the idea of the four temperaments from ancient Greece. So we have the blood, bile, uh, black bile, and phlegm. So they have these different characteristics or personalities. So our the red is you know hot headed, um, black is melancholy. Um, and we actually still see some of these stereotypes in modern media. So here are our Power Rangers, the black guys, the black ranger. The Native American one is the red ranger and the Asian is yellow. I think we can do better than that. So let's move on a little bit forward in time. So after Linnaeus, we had Johann Frederick Blumenbach. Um, and he is widely considered to be the father, father of modern physical or biological anthropology. Um, he revised uh, Linnaeus's systems. First, he threw out Homo sapiens ferus, that's not a thing, and also Homo sapiens monstrosus, and he removed chimpanzees from within our genus and put them within their own genus. Instead of Homo troglodytes, they are now Pan troglodytes. He also classified five races of humans specifically for the sake of convenience. So he has Ethiopian, American, Asian, Caucasian, and Malayan. Um, we do uh, notice that there are several regular similarities or differences in the shape of human crania and diff from different populations, which you can see here. And how Blumenbach noted was that there was the middle is closest to the original, of course, Caucasian bias here. And then in either direction, we are getting extremes of different types. Um, what One thing he did well, though, was he actually took the time to try and um, meet the 
people from different cultures. So he was actually befriending and using examples of uh, leaders of these different cultures. So he was actually trying to do a little bit better. So here we have a Mongolian painter, we have a Mohawk leader, we have an Ottoman ambassador, we have a Tahitian celebrity, and then we have an Ethiopian clergyman. So this is a not as bad as others. Um, one thing I do find confusing is Blumenbach did this. He created these five groups and he wrote about them. But he also said human groups are impossible to separate by any but very arbitrary limits. So I'm not quite sure what he was trying to say because he's making two contradictory statements. And he also noticed that individual Africans differ as much or even more from other Africans as from Europeans. And this is something we see today when we look at genetic studies. So he was definitely in the right direction, but even so, he still named five different races of humans. Next, we have Georges Cuvier um, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Um, he was a comparative anatomist. He was known for his uh, theory of catastrophism. Um, and he named three races, so Africans, Europeans, and Asians. One of the debates when people are trying to figure out how many different groups of humans there are and what we should name them are the idea of monogenism and polygenism. Um, so let's break down these words. Mono is one, poly is many. Genism is origin. So this means people are arguing, are there many origins of humans or is there a single origin of, for humans? What the implications of this debate are people are trying to figure out are these racial characteristics that we're seeing, are they fixed or are they changeable? The monogenists, if they are arguing there's a single origin for humans, and yet we're seeing a really big variety. So they would argue that these characteristics are changeable because we had to have a change from this single origin into the wide variety we see today. Polygenists argue that these characteristics are fixed. So there are multiple independent origins of each group and that these characteristics we see are not changing. And you can see, depending on which camp you choose, there are political and very racist ramifications for how we can talk about different groups. Um, in the 1800s, we're seeing more and more of this transition to scientific studies for race, and people are trying to figure out what measurement, what number can I use to back up these different classifications. Um, two of the common things that were done were a cephalic index, or looking at cranial capacity. One of the people who did this was Samuel George Morton. He was a physician, and he really liked to look at crania. Um, he named four different races because he's taking a, looking at different crania and making measurements, and he has European, Asian, Native American, and African. Um, so some of the ways you can classify the shapes of heads is you can look basically how wide are they, how long are they, how tall are they, and so you can create um, different categories here. So we have brachycephalic or broad-headed, mesocephalic or medium-headed, medium and dolicocephalic or long-headed. Um, and for a while, this was taken as, oh, we can clearly classify different groups of people have a different shape to their head. However, Franz Boas, in the early 1900s, he came along and he showed that the cephalic index isn't fixed. So he's looking at um, people who are born in the U.S. versus recent immigrants. And he's showing that there isn't... Um, any relationship between these two different groups of people and that it's changing between these. And that this shows that the phallic index is affected by the environment, not by uh, your ancestry or what race you are. Now we have more and more statistical techniques that we're using, and one of them is k-means clustering. Um, this is actually a really cool statistical technique. It's just if you have a bunch of data points, um, it will help you discover the clusters within. Um, officially, we cluster n data points into k clusters. What this means is we have whatever, however many data points you have, but you need to tell the program how many clusters are in your data. Um, just an example here, if this is our data here, are all of our data points on this graph, and I know that I have three different groups in this cluster. 
this is how it would look like. Here is the program telling me that where the three groups are. However, I said that there were three groups in this data. If I gave it a different number for K, I would get different groups. People have tried to use this method for humans. And you can see in this publication, they're trying a couple different um, instances of this, of K of two, three, four, five, and six. But you'll notice they didn't know how many groups were humans have in the beginning. This is not the appropriate technique to use for this instance. So sure, they're finding different delineations depending on which um, number for K they're using, but this is an incorrect application of this statistical tool. And we cannot use K-means clustering to discover how many races of humans there are. So as we're thinking about this, are there consensus on how humans differ? You should probably know by now that the answer to this question is no. Everybody has a different definition and different people think there are different numbers of races or groups of humans. But second, is human biological variation meaningful? Take a moment and write down this question for yourself. In my opinion, I do think human biological variation is meaningful, and it's really cool to see the, all of the different um, adaptations and traits in different groups of humans. And it's a really great way to understand evolution and how we are the way we are. Unfortunately, a lot of people use this to um, try and create separations between different groups of humans and um, back up systemic prejudice and systemic racism. So I hope that as you're learning more about how humans vary, you're using it as a way to appreciate and celebrate humans rather than subjugate them. Um, today, the US Census still includes race as a part of this. Um, so their groups are white, black or African-American, Asian, American Indian or Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, and of course, the lovely category of other. They also separately include ethnicity as Hispanic or not. Personally, I don't find this classification system very helpful. But, and even though there is more and more information out there that race is a social construct, we're still seeing these categories persist today. And people are forced to make a choice when we're filling out forms such as the census. To close this out, remember that race is a social construct and black lives do matter. Unfortunately, science has for centuries been used to justify the subjugation and systemic racism against black people. Other groups as well, but black people have suffered more than each other. What we want to do is understand the history and understand how science has been used to perpetuate racism so we can help reveal our blind spots so we can try to be better. We should seek to dismantle and identify all of these unconscious biases.